and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from the Word Refinery. You have no idea how many times I accidentally called it World. And creator of the upcoming um, Koboa set setting for, bo for both D&D 5e, Pathfinder, and... Uh, and, well, not at the time you had written it as Co as Cold Press's um, fantasy role-playing game, and now that that actually has a name, Tales of the Valiant. <laughs> and... As, and and some and someone who managed to get their particular project funded in about four hours. Congratulations, by the way. The Thank one and sure. only Adrian Me Meja. I'm pretty Mejia. sure I'm pretty sure I mispronounced that, but yeah. that's fine. So uh, yeah, how you Adrian Meja. Uh, nice to be here. Thank you. Um, very excited to talk about Kaboa mm -hmm. and to talk with you. So, I'd like to start at the humble beginning, in a sense. Um, walk me through your introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. All right. Well, I had I had two introductions to role-playing games. Really, I remember one time, and it must have been like the third grade or something. Um, there was a new kid at school. We were kind of bored one day, and he's like, "Hey, let's play this one game. We need to make characters, and we need to, and then like." I just start making up a story, and you start telling me what you do, and I was like, oh, this is interesting. The uh, the game he got us through, what was it called? Oh, were you saying something? No. Oh. The game he played us through was called Nephilim, which I later went and found. It's like some, like, game where you play, like, as, like, these occult characters or whatever, but he, like, remembered... I don't know how much of it he got right or wrong, but he remembered a lot of it just out of his memory. He walked us through character creation, making stats, playing through a session without any supplies or books or anything. Like, he just had us, like, guess a number and how close we were to the number he was thinking of would be how successful we were instead of rolling and stuff like that. And I thought, this is really cool. This Nephilim game is really neat. Um, and then kind of like a couple of years later, somebody was talking about D&D and I was like, oh, this is like a whole genre of games. So we started a, like a D&D campaign and started DMing. This was um, during 3rd edition. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it kind of went off from there. Yep. Now, as I now as I understand it, you're right you're writing for for the for the time being two systems cuz obviously Cobalt's um, project isn't out yet. <laughs> um, right. So is it is is it going to be a case where you're going to be putting out a PDF for specifically for 5e and a different PDF specifically for Pathfinder Second Edition, or is it in an is it a all-in-one affair? No, the plan is to have separate PDFs for both. Um, we don't really like want to like take up space for somebody to have like both things on the same file or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we're just going to have separate files for those three systems. Right, and. Was it a was it a case where walk me walk? I'm guessing I'm guessing that part of the reason for the for the whole addressing multiple systems is I've tried I've tried to avoid talking about it, but some, but some of the fallout from the OGL fiasco a few months back. Yep, that's due to observation. Um, when we originally conceived of the project and. Working on it up until the beginning of this year, we were going to just be a 5e release. Um, we were just going to focus on 5e and put all our resources and efforts there. But then the whole OGL thing happened, and we were like, maybe 5e is not a safe place to be. Um, and we rearranged our whole procedure, our whole system. We found people to help us convert to what we already had to PF2. We found out about Global Press's new system. Mm -hmm. And we said, you know what? Maybe we can just release on a bunch of different systems. Um, were you? And that's how it all got started. Were you familiar with Pathfinder 2E's quir um, quirks beforehand? 
Um, I was a little bit. Like, I hadn't played it, but I had read through the whole rule book at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I had researched it quite a bit. I obsessively read TTRPGs for fun. So I had some ideas of what was to be expected there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can, I can, cer I can certainly, I can certainly get that. Oh. I've, I've been watching the rules lawyer uh, go through his experiences with shifting from D from D and D to Pathfinder because. I think a lot of people had this had the idea that because of the origin of Pathfinder that it'd be easy to jump from um, 5e to Pathfinder 2nd Edition and got the rudest of awakenings. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean... I mean, they're different systems, right? And, I mean, Pathfinder 1st Edition, I remember being quite similar to 3.5, but 2nd uh, but Edition seems to be its own thing to a pretty large extent. Yeah, second edition is a bit more of a granular affair, and I I um I did do a discussion video regarding the upcoming remaster that they're putting out, which they plan to release the same month as the quote unquote one D and D project. I know that they're I know that Wizards is calling it a, is calling it just um fifth edition because that's not going to get confusing at all or it or anything. <laughs> But right. I I have to I have to appreciate the fact that over the last couple over the last few weeks Paizo has been getting really cheeky. <laughs> um, I mean, Orc was pretty cheeky to begin with. Yeah, we did we did a we did a video discussing the draft of Orc, and there there is some there's some bold moves being done there's some bold moves regarding what it's doing, and. I do I do appreciate that they've explained why um they did why they did not go with creative commons. Mm -hmm. But what's your what's your take there like why do you think they didn't go with creative commons? Oh, they out they outright said it. Oh, I must have missed this. Cuz in the draft there is a there is a secondary document called um, answers and explanations, or acts, and it lays it lays right out it lays right out why why they did why they um why they read why they registered it at why they registered it as a copyright instead instead of going Creative Commons. The reason the reason they did it was so that was so that there was a version of Orc that could not be modified that could not be uh, modified after the fact. Now, somebody wants to put a, make a fork of it. That's perfectly that's perfectly fine. Hmm. Um, Interesting. But they specifically wanted to have it have it as a registered copyright within the li within the Library of Congress, so that there's a version that can't be messed with. Is let, let's not forget yeah. the whole reason this this thing went the this chaos went down was because. Somebody at Wizards decide, hey, hey, let's me let's mess with this thing that's been that's been a gentleman's agreement for the last twenty three years. Right. But, yeah, and, bold, bold move on their part. Mm -hmm. Now, when it com when it comes to the the first, I suppose, the first thing that we can go into is is kind of the is kind of the forms and the and kind of kind of the kind of the vibe that each that each of them goes with. So, I'm gonna go through the ones that were listed in the um, preview document and just and just give and just ask you to give the skinny on each of them. So, oh sure, yeah. Um, starting with the Chanov, and feel free to correct me if I mispronounce any. Okay. Well, all of their names are made up, so I don't, I don't feel like you need to worry too much about mispronouncing them. Like we intentionally chose uh, made up names for these mm -hmm. to make it a little less of a concern about mispronunciation and stuff. Um, Chanov is kind of like our version of like our idea of like being able to mix forms was important to us in our design. So Chanov allows you to. It's yeah. yeah it's, I should change the name to be something more later in the alphabet. But anyway, um, Chinov is like the 
the form that lets you mix other forms. It lets you mix three forms together to create something really unique mm -hmm. um, and to kind of like bring abilities that might be interesting to you or might be interesting narratively um, for your character. Yep. Is that is that the skinny? Mm -hmm. um, Gintac. Yeah, so the Gintac are based on the Gurupita story in South and uh, some Amazonian peoples, particularly around Brazil and Paraguay. Um, they have fiery hair, they are very fast, and their feet point to the reverse of the direction they walk. They, their feet point backwards. Um, and in the stories, that is because that makes them hard to track um, by humans or by any predators that might want to hunt them down. Because it looks like they're going the opposite direction that they're going. Mm -hmm. Um, so we we tried to make them very we tried to capture some of like that trickery um in their stories some of the some of the mystical elements that are are involved there, yeah. Um. So next next would be the Guveng. Yeah, Guveng are my favorite. They are based on stories of the Antikara, um, which are more in like northern northwestern Amazon. But they are completely, they are made up of a swarm of insects. Mm -hmm. They're kind of like a hive mind type situation. Um, so we played around a lot with giving them like the ability to turn into a swarm of things. Like I feel like D&D in particular doesn't use swarms enough. Like they're such an interesting category of creatures and characters. Mm -hmm. um, so you can be like a swarm as a Guvang and you can kind of like separate parts of your body to replicate effects like Mage Hand and stuff like that. So it, it's we've had a lot of fun with playtesting those. Mm -hmm. uh, when you meant when you mentioned them being a swarm like that, the first thing that came to mind was um Spider's Man. Yes. <laughs> I love Spider's Man. Um the Seal. Seal, yeah. Seal are fairy like creatures. Um, they're actually based on a creature from stories in Congo, out in Africa. Um, kind of like stories that also you see a little bit in South America and probably can be traced back to Congo. Um, and they kind of like, they're kind of like one of our uh, forms that we're using to kind of like touch on Afro Latina culture. Um, so they, they have fairy-like wings, they can fly a little bit, not too long, but a little bit of time, and they have some magical powers over, particularly over things about light, uh, based around light, so they can cast fairy fire, they can cast light. Mm -hmm. Yep. But since they, since they are fairy adjacent, that, um, I will, I will not trust them, because... Well, princi well, principle. Any anything, rem anything remotely, fa remotely fairy. I do not. I trust with it. I trust as far as I can throw. <laughs> well, that's how all the stories go, right? Like they're always tricking you and taking advantage of people. I guess, mm -hmm. at least in the uh, fae type of stories in the yeah. north. Oh. Uh in ver in various way in various ways but the other thing is that they is doing things that seem that seem to make absolutely no sense but make but make mm. perfect sense to them okay cuz they have like this whole different perspective on the universe or mm -hmm. what's right and what's wrong okay yeah that makes sense now When it comes to classes, I know that there's a bunch of sub of subclasses that you're putting in, but I'd like to focus on the two full-on classes that you're adding. Okay. So I I believe one of them you listed on the Kickstarter, the Brujes. Yep, yep. So Brujes we're very excited about. Um, the story of the class is that they are practitioners of old Kobo and magical traditions that were lost or kind of like the tradition was because of the colonization efforts, they lost the knowledge that they would have had, that they had for these practices. And so they're kind of trying to re rediscover them. But while they're rediscovering them, they don't have full control over their magical powers. 
So there's a random element to them where instead of casting spells directly, you're casting a group of spells. Um, and you don't know which spell you're going to get, but you you know you might choose the harmful group of spells. And then you kind of roll to see what you get. You can you get abilities to modify what you end up rolling um, to make it higher or to be able to choose something lower. Um, and that affects uh, what they end up casting. They might end up casting something like a cantrip. They might end up casting like a fireball. And it's kind of like fun. And in our playtesting, we found a way to like really bring them within a good band of power levels. So they're not like... So it always feels good to like play as them. You never feel like you're not doing anything or like you're taking over the game. So it it isn't a case of say wild magic that just puts some extra asterisk on spe on set spells. It's more of you are you are the spells from a hat guy. Yeah, kind of like that. And as you get more powerful, you get more powerful spells in your hat, and you get more abilities to kind of like not randomly get a spell, but kind of like decide what the die is going to roll as when you need it to. Yeah, but I'm I'm guessing that for the most part you're not even at high levels you're not going to have complete control over what you're over what you're casting, which would so in within the universe would that would that mean that they end up being end up being looked at a bit as a a bit as a loose ca a bit as a loose cannon because of because of the fact that their magic is such a grab bag. I think they, I think you could see them that way. We try to make the narrative so far be. A, we, we've been seeing the narrative a little more as they're seen more more mystical. Like even sorcerers and wizards, like the way that D and D approaches their magic, it's very. It feels more like science than something magical or or secret. Um, because you always know what you always know what's gonna with what comes in, what's gonna come out, and we kind of wanted something that feels a little more like the way that real magic magic is seen in the real world, where people don't know how it works or they don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now, as men as mentioned, there's there's a lot of subclasses that you're do that you're doing, and, and that's not even getting into the ones that have been added through um, through stretch goals. So something that so something that I'd like to tr I'd like to try is I'm going to go I'm going to go through several of the um several of the core classes and I'd like you to t I'd like you to tell me um what at least one at least one example of a subclass you have for it if and if we don't have one for it then we'll just move on to the next one. Okay. So Okay, yeah. I mean yeah, our, our base, our base, what we're offering is one subclass for each class, and then an additional subclass through stretch goals. But yeah, we can we can go through it, and I can talk about the ones that we're sure about, and for some of them we might not be sure. So All I might right. not get a subclass there. Um, barbarian. Yeah, so barbarian, we've got the path of the bond. Um, in Koboa, the colonizers, uh, their primary warriors were barbarians. Um, who kind of are their version of conquistadors coming in and beating people up and dominating things. Um, and they they gain magical powers over disease to make their to plague their enemies with sickness and you know pogs. Mm -hmm. um, so the path of the bond is barbarians who had those powers who decided like you know they kind of regretted um, causing pain and suffering. So they start using their powers over disease to create bonds that are um, symbiotic rather than harmful. Um, so they can they can you know give their they can give their allies powers or abilities or resistances through their mastery of you know microscopic organisms mm -hmm. to uh, to kind of like unite the whole party with like a telepathic bond, for example, or maybe resistance to particular damage types. Mm -hmm. Um. The Bard. Bard, yeah. So we have the uh, College of Guardianship is what we're calling it right now. Probably will change. But that one kind of like, one of our designers kind of just made it more as a bottom-up design where they, they thought it was funny that um, suggestion, you know, the spell that, or no, command, the one that lets you say a one-word command. Um, they found it funny that in Spanish you could tell somebody to attack you, but you can't do that in English because attack me is two words in English, but one word in Spanish. So they kind of built a whole subclass around that mm -hmm. to have a bard that um, that can that is very good at getting people to attack them 
and therefore kind of act as the tank for the party. Yep. Uh, cleric. Cleric, yeah. Um, cleric. Do we have a cleric class that we can talk about? We have... I'm going to skip cleric. All right. Druid. Sorry, druid. The mystery of the druid. <laughs> <laughs> so with Druid, we have actually we've already unlocked two subclasses for Druid. So we have the Druid, the Feral Druid, which is a Druid that is strength based rather than anything else. Um, and instead of morphing into animals, they can transform into a feral shape, where they take on animal like characteristics until they can take on until they can take on like a full like feral form. Um, and they're very combat focused, very melee focused. Um, yeah, but then we also have the Druid of the Sacred Transformation, which is more of a Druid that uses their power to transform other people. Um, so they, they focus a lot on this spell that allows them to transform enemies or other creatures into food, um, which is kind of a, it's kind of a religious thing for them. They're kind of like a Druids of this of this weird religion that the colonizers brought with them. Um, they can also, like, transform their blood into acid and, like, just do all these other interesting transformations to, like, kind of, like, change the equations of combat. Mm -hmm. um, when you meant, when you mentioned the fer the way you described the feral um, druid, the two things came to mind. One, since it's strength-based, we finally have a muscle caster. <laughs> I've had I've had the I've had the joke of the muscle wizard for many years. <laughs> I can't even I love it. <laughs> well the whole thing started because somebody asked Okay, wizards use intelligence, clerics and druids use wisdom, sorcerers use charisma, why don't we have a spell casting class for one of the physical abilities? Like strength. And thus the muscle wizard was born when everybody said, That is a completely stupid idea. Let's do it anyways. <laughs> Oh. The other thing that came to mind in a, in a somewhat roundabout way with the Feral Druid, especially with the transformation you mentioned, is something akin to a skin changer. Hmm. Okay, yeah, I can... Skin changer, like, uh... Actually, I'm not familiar with skin changers. What are What skin changers are we talking about here? Oh. I have I have to make. Sh uh. Skin change. There w obviously the one of the skin obviously one of the skin changers was the companion of Radagast in, uh, in, um, Tolkien's work. But there but it's usually it's another form of um, of shapeshifter. Oh, uh, um, okay, okay. Um, there's been, there's the in um. Obvi obviously, so obviously, stuff like werewolves are are a sig are a big are a significant example, but then you have, but um. I suppose I suppose one of the big examples I could br I could bring up is um, Wendigos, um, and skin, and of co of course the um, skin the skinwalkers in um, Nav in Navajo mythos. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll have to look these up, but yeah, like when you say like um, werewolves and stuff, yeah, that's definitely like kind of like how they feel and how they play a lot. Mm -hmm. Not transforming into a full-on wolf, but th but this mix this mix of elements that nobody wants nobody wants to be in the business end of. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. Getting back to the list, um, the fighter. Fighter, yeah. So fighter, we have the um, the blade hand, which are fighters that specialize in two weapon fighting. Um, but particularly they specialize in bonding in the mystical way with their weapons to like to like be able to see through them or to to like really like be able to like control them like they're controlling their own hands mm -hmm. um to the point where they're basically their own hands 
is it a, is it a case where at at higher le at higher levels those the weapons they're bonded with are treated as natural weapons or something? Maybe. I just yeah, the way yeah. yeah the way you the way you described it that's what came that's what came to mind. I appreciate um a emphasis on dual wielding because that's one of those things that's a dual wielding is a popular fantasy, but a lot of get a lot of games struggle with it. Um, it really does feel underserved. Yeah, I do remember doing a house rule years ago where if you had dual wielding, you were sub you could be subject to what I called the flip rule. The flip rule is ba is basically if you just if you declare that you're flipping it, your your natural result is basically whatever you rolled minus twenty, i.e., you're flipping the die over. The catch is mm. you step down your damage die when you do it. So you're tra you're trading oh. you're trading damage for you're trading damage to get a, to get a eat to get an easier shot. And it's meant to be used when you ro when you rolled terribly. So you get to invoke that rule after you see the results of your roll. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. So it's kind of like a reroll. No, it's better than a reroll. It's better than a reroll, the... but you're doing less damage. Right, right. So you said you step down the damage die one step. Yeah. So if you if okay. you're dual wielding and you're using say, um, say long say long swords, you know, D a d6. If you do okay. if you use the flip rule, then you're treating it as a d4. Kind of like minus one damage on average. What if it does deal one d4? Do you go to like a flip a coin? Um, no, you just go to one. Oh, okay. So one d four goes down to one. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't want to. I didn't want to deal with one d two, and then what? And then um, one. So, and then below that, so I was just like, no, nope, it goes straight. To, it's a straight one. Okay. Huh. That's an interesting rule. Mm -hmm. I like it. Ah. Uh, so next is the one that is that is part of my namesake and and well my gimmick for most of my gaming career the monk <laughs> well we just unlocked today um the monk subclass which is the monk the way of the lines mm -hmm. um based a little bit on the nazca lines so um these monks channel the ley lines of the world um on their own skin or or in the battlefield so they can they can summon they can start they can draw a ley line while they're fighting in, in the battlefield um tracing it through the battlefield and invoking different kinds of ley lines abilities into it so they might they might be able to they might invoke the line of the sun to cause fire damage to their enemies or the line of the tree to like root their enemies in place or even like you know do something that helps their allies like increase their ac or whatever they can also passively channel the lines to gain like a fly to be able to fly and stuff like that um uh, given that given that amount of variety um I'm guessing that I'm guessing that it's not a case it's not a case of pick from a list a la way of four elements which is probably the least picked um monk subclass of the core ones <laughs> yeah it's more like it's more like you have these options and like they're each turn you can channel one of them mm-hmm and then eventually they gain some passive channels, and they can switch those after a long rest. Would it would it be fair to say that that um characters who do who do follow the way of the lines will have Nazca line like patterns tattooed on themselves? I I fully expect that most like it's not a requirement, but I expect that most people who make these characters will probably want to do that, and that's definitely the um, the artwork that we put out. Um, Paladin. Paladin. We have the Oath of the Liberator. Um, these Paladins specialize in mounted combat. So they they get mounts early, and they can do cool things with their mounts. Um, eventually they turn their mounts into T-Rexes and just have a whole lot of fun. Somebody, somebody had watched too much Dino Riders as a kid, I swear. <laughs> hey. Uh, Who doesn't have a fantasy of riding a dinosaur? Uh, well, I did play. I did play way too much Golden Axe growing up, <clears throat> which <laughs> led to a hatred of gnomes. But if you've played the original Golden Axe, you know why. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but next is the class that's been that's been that's been the unlucky motherfucker since since for since its earliest days, and that's the ranger. <laughs> Right, the ranger. Yeah, so for the ranger, we have the ranger of the sacred below, which was um, these rangers specialize in underground exploration and stuff. They're they're defenders of the underground to mm-hmm. keep it safe from the colonizers mining or from monsters that might wander in. Um, they have the ability to confuse people, um, to, to make people think they're going one way when they're actually going another way. And they can also, like, summon, like, poisonous gases and stuff like that from underground. Mm-hmm. So, next would be the rogue. Yeah, so for the rogue, we have the city soul. Um, these rogues are kind of like... They're, in in Koboa, cities can have a little bit of magic just from their essence, just from being a place where lots of people agglomerate. And... This magic can take. This magic appears in the forms of like folk magic and traditions that are that just change the world a little bit. And rogues learn to harness that magic and that power. The city soul can use traditions and stuff like that to enchant their enchant their gear or to channel different parts of the city to get different effects. So city souls can channel different parts of the city. Um, they they get a list of abilities. Some that pertain to like the financial sector of a city, some that pertain to like a culture sector of a city, and they can kind of like mix and match them um, to create a build that they like. We're still kind of like ironing out the details; like we're still not quite happy with it in playtest, but that's kind of like what we're working with. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the point of playtesting to make your stuff suck less. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, the sorcerer, not to be confused with his horse, horserer. <laughs> Yeah, so Sorcerer, we have the Stone-Touched Sorcerer, which are kind of like basically Geomancers. Um, there's a lot of stories, particularly around like Incan cultures, about like people who could control stone and stuff. There's particularly a story about an emperor who raised a stone army to win a battle. Mm-hmm. Um, and we kind of have that with the Stone-Touched Sorcerer, who can raise an army, a tiny army, a tiny army of tiny soldiers, a swarm of tiny soldiers. And you kind of summon them in battle and make make them do things. And it's fun to be a swarm, and it's also fun to have, like, a little swarm pet that does things for you. Especially if they're, like, tiny stone soldiers, kind of like G.I. Joes. I was going to say either the size of a G.I. Joe or the size of a nutcracker. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think there's a little um, flexibility there. Yep. Um, I will I will admit that one of my favorite combinations that and one that annoys everybody whenever I do it is <clears throat> well I what I like to call a um palerer. Okay, so a, a paladin sorcerer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's also called a sor cal it's also called a um sor caladin. But that okay. doesn't roll as that doesn't roll as well off the tongue. Right, yeah. Uh oh. so do they just spite a lot? Is that their is that their thing? The main reason to do it is is um I heard you like smiting, so I put your so I put some smiting and some smiting while you, so you can so you can smite evil while you smite evil. <laughs> I can see I can see that yeah. You know because both of them are um both of the, both the sorcerer and the and the um. And the paladin are charisma centric. Okay, so you can you can just focus on your charisma to yeah do big damage. Okay, yeah big di- um that and get that and get some um, and get and since since some. Um, it's more it's more the fact that Paladin's fuel smite with spell slots and sorcerer has a lot of spell slots. And can get even more spell slots back with their sorcery points. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I like that. And the, and then Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica happened and Illusionist Bracers became a thing and it got even worse. And my GMs hate it. <laughs> 
You know, so, which which lets you use green flame blade, blade twice in a turn. So which even is, if okay. even after running out of spells, I can still make two attacks that each add twice charisma to melee damage. <laughs> yeah, that's nasty. Again, this is the reason why whenever I break this build out, my DM hates me. <laughs> but my response yeah. has always been the same. Don't hate the player, hate the game. <laughs> Oh, but next on the list is Warlock. Warlock, yeah. So with Warlocks, we have the Serp the Elder Serpent patron. So Koboa doesn't have a lot of dragons in the continent. They they live in other continents. Um, the colonizers brought them in, but the what takes their spot in the ecosystem are these giant, giant serpents. Um, the eldest of which are basically like demigods. And... Warlock, and they'll sometimes choose Warlocks to, to help them do their bidding. So, Warlocks of the Path of the Serpent, uh, Pact of the Serpent, sorry, get a lot of, like, water-based abilities. They also get a lot of weather-based abilities, because Elder Serpents are also, like, very climate-controlled type creatures. Um, they also, like, have a cool little ability where they can, like, constrict enemies with, like, an elemental serpent and, like, keep them from moving. Mm-hmm. So, with that with that in mind, um, next up, next on the list, and the fi the final one of the core classes is wizard. The wizard. Yep. All right, I'm I'm legally huh. required to do the to do that joke regarding Rincewind from Discworld, because he kept adding Z's <laughs> into into his title of wizard. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, so um, for wizards, we have the um, School of the Sun and Moon, um, which is a wizard that focuses a lot on astronomy and the and like celestial bodies. They get a lot of um, kind of like mystical abilities, but their main thing is that they they can concentrate on multiple spells at once, and they get bonus. And they and not only that, but they they group their spells into opposing groups of spells. So, like, two schools, I, I believe each group is four, two schools of magic. Um, and if they, if they, if they are concentrating on two spells of opposite schools of magic, like, they, they, they define, like, what the opposite spells are, but, like, they get special abilities as long as they're channeling opposite spells, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always fun. We've had players, like, really dig into the spell list to try to figure out fun combinations for that. Yeah, I can... I can get I can get behind that. <laughs> that's that's all the classes, yeah. right? Yeah. And okay. Now on the Kickstarter page, it mentioned that you were adding two classes. What could you tell me about the other one? So the other one currently we have our our draft of what we call the the Rhythmatist. These are um. Uh, martial class that their story is that they're connected to the first rhythm of the world that the whole the whole world operates on a kind of rhythm um, and if you can sense it you can you can not only predict what's going to happen but you can make things happen mm -hmm. so arithmetists focus a lot on on arts like the first rhythm is very related to art some of them focus on dance other ones might focus on cooking or eloquent speech it's a little, it's a little bard-like, but they they use their abilities more in martial combat. Where, as long as they're keeping the right rhythm in combat, they can make all kinds of cool things happen. So they kind of like, they kind of operate on like a, 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 a kind of like a revolving scale of things that they do. Uh, it's a little hard to describe, but we're still like play testing it. We're still trying to get it right, um, so we don't talk about it as much. <laughs> yeah, I I can I can certainly get that. Um, now, when it comes to the when it comes to the monsters that you have, I'm guessing I'm guessing that that um you're go that it's going to be it's going to be across the different tiers. There's going to be the low end as and as well as monsters that would require um legendary actions. Yeah, that's that's what we're hoping to do. Um. We're, dead, we're probably not going to have a lot of space in the final product for a lot of monsters, so we need to like be really 
careful well not careful but we need to really think through what we're going to include but we definitely do want to have some stuff that you can play at like first level as well as like some major stuff that you can kind of like look forward to facing mm -hmm. yeah, and i'm get <clears throat> i'm guessing that you also plan on having a weapon and armor list since the standard weapon and armor list just wouldn't be compatible with this kind of setting yeah yeah we have kind of like for some for some weapons, we're kind of just saying like, yeah, like there's this other weapon that you can play as like the same stats or whatever. But we're also like creating our own weapons and like weapon mastery feats for specific kinds of weapons that you don't really see in other like in your standard D and D setting. Oh, well, you, I already, I, I already saw that you have what looks like a Mahahuitil, and I, I know I screwed up pronunci pronunciation on that, but <laughs> it's. A we it's a weapon type that I ha that I happen to be fond of. Um, do you? Yeah, they're those are technically not South American, but we're all obsessed with it, so we included and we included it anyway. And hopefully that wasn't like a terrible mistake, but but we're excited to have that there. Yeah, and how how could you how could you say no to a to a club lined with obsidian that can take people's heads off? Right, like you can't, you can't, you can't blame us for including it. Well, a lot of people, a lot of people seem seem to forget that a lot of the stuff that was in, that's include that was included in the original D and D was just st was just stuff that Gygax and Arneson happened to be fans of. And you look through, <laughs> you look through game design, um, th throughout throughout the decades, you'll see little things that pe that designers put in just because they felt like it. Or some, or sometimes it's meant to be some giant in joke. Hmm. Um, right. Like for for instance, with the with Unreal, the ASMD launcher. ASMD supposedly being an acronym for "and suck my dick." <laughs> huh. Learn something new every day. Or Rise of the Triad having both a god mode, which. Just has you being invincible and throwing fireballs, and just because they felt like doing it, a dog mode. <laughs> Which Wait, are you literally a dog? Yes, you're a, you're a dog for a, for a minute. <laughs> oh. no, re Wonderful. no, no reason why they why they did it. They just felt like doing it. They just thought it was cool. Yeah. yeah. And, that's, that's how you get the funnest things, right? It's when you do things you think are cool. Oh, uh, I remember. I remember Paula Schur, a who's a graphic designer, once saying, "The greatest innovations in the history of mankind were done by people who had no idea what they were doing." <laughs> uh, and I'm guessing. I'm guessing that when it comes to when it comes to um, some of the new some of the new spells, um, are is is it going to be a case where that where um it's going to be it's going to be listed, um, how the, how they how they'd factor into the spell list for the casting classes that can have them. I'm sorry, I I missed you the first half of your question. Can you repeat that? When it comes to the spells that you're adding, I'm guessing. You're going to be putting in how they'd fit into the casting classes that have access to them. That's correct. Yeah, I, most of them will have like this is part of the standard casting list for the spell list for these classes. Mm -hmm. And there's at least two that we're keeping specifically to just subclasses, though. Like they're they're not going to appear in any spell list except specific subclasses that we're making. Yeah, that makes that makes sense, especially especially given how some. Some subclasses have a have a expanded spell list. Right, exactly. Oh. Now, with all that with all that in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as a page count? Um, putting aside stretch goals because that's because that's obviously a um, gamble. Yeah, so, I mean, so our dream is to have something that's, like, in the 200s or 250s. 
Um, for that, we do need some stretch goals. So putting aside the stretch goals, we figure that like the bare minimum we're willing to do is 150 pages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I could certainly see that. And what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Um, we're, we, we really want to get it as soon as possible, but, um, like with all the, all the goals that we have and with our goals to put it in three different systems to translate it and stuff, we've been carefully making what's called like a Gantt chart, like a kind of like a, a calendar of how things are going to go. And it looks like our estimates are that we should have it ready by the end of 2024 or early or sorry, end of 20. Oh gosh. What did I? You said end of 2024. Is that yeah? What? Uh, let me look at the Gantt chart again because I I keep I keep getting the years confused. Like at one point somebody asked me and I said like the end of 2022 and I was like wait that already happened. Um, I'm not lending you my DeLorean. Yeah, so, at... <laughs> yeah, so end of 2024 is actually what we're thinking. Like I think we can have the PDF done like mid 2024, but then especially with um. For physical products with the way that shipping is and stuff it's very unreliable so we're putting in a lot of like padding time for ourselves to like be able to say like yeah like this will arrive even if it's late mm -hmm. um so we're kind of giving ourselves like end of 2024 for like physical products and mid 2023 mid 2024 for like pdf digital products and I'm, I'm guessing a lot of the subclasses that that i mentioned before and when it comes to their pathfinder 2 equivalent those are going to fall into the category of archetypes? Yeah, archetypes, or, or possibly even just, like, the player feats, not oh, the character, the class feats. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are the main two categories we're thinking about using. For some of them that are a little more complex, we're thinking we might want to make, like, a class, but we're not totally, like... Like, that would be a lot more effort, obviously, and probably, like, we'd create more content. Mm -hmm. But, um... But if, if, if we want to do some subclasses justice, we might do that. Yeah, and I'm, gu I'm guessing for the Pathfinder 2, two versions of the forms, they're, go they're going to have, the each of the forms is going to have their own um, collection of feats the way um, Ancestries have their own feats in Pathfinder 2e? Yeah, that's correct. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. Which cert certainly, makes se certainly makes sense. And I'm when it comes to the spell casting, in the Pathfinder 2e version, are you planning on having it so that it fits within the four the four types of casting that's with that's um, that's within Pathfinder? You know, I'm actually a little rusty on Pathfinder spell casting. Can you remind me the four kinds of spell casting? Yeah, give me give me a second to gr to grab that from my notes because I have way too many PDFs. Oh. <laughs> Although I will note, I I always use I always use custom character sheets when it comes to Pathfinder because the the core one <clears throat> is a little ugly. Yep. But yeah, we've been uh, we've been thinking about making our own for Kaboa because I think that'd be fun too. Yeah, but the four are arcane, divine, primal, and occult. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. Now I remember. Yeah, we'll probably we'll probably get it to fit within those four categories. I don't I don't expect we'll have to like do anything tricky, but probably we can just get things to fit in there. Yeah, the the only thing that might be tricky is is when it comes to what when it comes to what classes or archetypes as far as as far as the casting end of things are going to fit within that. Like you'd have you would have to figure out for example, if what um what type of caster Bruhez are? Yeah, yeah, we'd have to decide on one of those spells. Or e either types that, of either magic that, or, um, that, e either that, or um, that either that or go or go or go with something completely crazy. Either either way hmm. works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But. Yeah, I'll have to talk to somebody who's... So we, we have somebody who's very experienced with um, Pathfinder 2 um, doing the conversions right now mm -hmm. for the stuff that we already had before we decided to do things in Pathfinder 2. So I'll, I'll have to ask them because I think they already looked at the Bruja and had some ideas. So I'll have to double check on what they, what they were making there. Yeah. 
and with the and I will certainly be looking forward to how to how it develops. With the, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the particular band of crazy that happens around here. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. I, I love talking about um, my project, and especially love talking about it with people who who know about role playing games and mm -hmm. stuff. It's always fun. Our questions. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to talk, whether it's to talk further about Koboa or talk about how the about how the um, ranger is is probably gonna go probably gonna go through another fix or figure out what the hell what the hell is going on with warlocks. <laughs> the door is always <laughs> open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And of, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! Bye-bye.